this monkey and I are spiritually soul bound, and we first met many past lives ago in the Roman Colosseum. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Unbelievable, the podcast where I tell my friend two unbelievable stories from history. And I have to guess which one's which. That's right. I am eighth wonder of the world, Luis Mejia, joined here by Step Right Up, Step Right Up, it's P.T. Barnum's Dirty Little Secret, Kurt Danner. Ooh, circus material. (laughs) That's right. And we are back once again, as with every episode, trying to convince Kurt that my stories are indeed real. We are starting our third season, and to this point, I am still yet to be fooled. So, will this trend continue? Only time will tell. But since I'll be taking the reins on this episode, before we get started, as always, Kurt, do you have a fast fact for me? I sure do, Luis. So, riddle me this, Luis, my boy. True or false? Uh, Ketchup as we know it, was originally sold as a medicine. So before 1834, ketchup was made based on fish or mushrooms. In 1834, this physician from Ohio, John Cook, had the radical idea to throw some tomatoes in there and make a tomato-based ketchup, and he sold it as a cure for indigestion, diarrhea, jaundice, and rheumatism. True or false? I think that's false, Kurt. You're not buying it. Yeah, I'm not buying it. You're, you're not into the medicinal values of, of a little ketchup. <laughs> you know, I think we are underestimating just how much humans fall to the rule of, hey, maybe that's just real tasty. Well, that is actually true, Luis. Uh, I hey. guess John Cook, he thought, you know, some extra vitamins and antioxidants or something in there. So maybe it can do these things. It wasn't until the late 19th century that ketchup was popularized as a condiment rather than a medicine. So think about that seriously. Next time you're having some ketchup, that this is what people thought medicine tasted like. Maybe that's why I'm so healthy, Kurt, with just the absurd amounts of ketchup that I consume. You're on the ketchup diet. I am on the ketchup diet, Kurt. It's just mm. ketchup and uh, lost dreams. <laughs> but with that, Kurt, we're gonna go spirit. ahead and get moving. <laughs> with that spirit of lost dreams, Kurt, we're going to be moving on to our stories for today. And you know what, Kurt? I've got two stories. That, you know, I'm going to be fully honest with you, deal with some fairly dark things. Mm. So I'm going to give a quick little content warning. We're going to be talking about death and we're going to be talking about animal abuse. Oh, no. And also animals relations with death. You know, you'll see what that looks like. Let's go ahead and go to our first story. This is just going to tell me the plot of I Am Legend right now. I'm actually going to cancel myself on this podcast, as I (laughs) uh, tend to do almost every single episode accidentally. That's true. Keep in mind that Luis chose one of these stories detail by detail, so whatever cruelty's in it is his own design. That's right. So if a story gets a little bit too intense for you... um, This this has got Luis Mejia's signature all over it. Take it out on Luis. (laughs) Yeah, take it out on me. It might have happened in my brain. (laughs) All right, Kurt. The year is 1916. Mm, Good year. Yeah, yeah, big time for the world. You know, there was a world war at this point. I don't know if you're familiar. And this world war is going on in Europe. And, you know, the U.S. is not involved at this point. And since this story is going to be taking place entirely in the U.S., we're really not going to concern ourselves much with the world war. And, you know, it's a wild time for the U.S. at this point because what's going on at this point? Jazz, mm-hmm. Dadaism, you know, uh, we're never going to die because we're going to buy every single thing on credit, <laughs> you know. Stocks are only going to go up from here, baby. These are never going to drop. The time to buy is now, you know. <laughs> so for this story, we're going to go to the beautiful state of Tennessee to the town of Irwin. Now, in this time period, there was a thing that all Americans loved. I'm talking here 1890s, late 1890s, early 1900s. Do you want to take Do you want to take a guess as to what that was? Um, children working in factories. Uh, th- that I would argue is still popular to this day. <laughs> um, aside from but that, aside from that, it was circuses. True circuses Timeless. or shows that displayed the fantastic, shows that showed the amazing. Now, how amazing, how fantastic are we talking about here? Now, as we made reference to in the beginning of the episode, there was a man named P.T. Barnum who was the owner of the P.T. Uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus Show, one of these great, wonderful circuses of the early 1900s. But although his name is the most popular, 
he was not the only one. Because there was also this man named Charlie Sparks. Ooh, who good was name for a person involved in circus things. Very good name. Now, he was, he was the owner of uh, the company named Sparks Famous Shows, which good. was another one of these traveling circus companies that would make tours or do tours around uh, the country. One of the attractions that you still had in these days um, was living animals. Right. Now, if you've been to a circus before, and I'm not saying that I'm an old person. You're not an old person. We're pretty young guys. But I remember going to a circus with animals. Do you, Kurt? No, I don't think I ever went to a circus. Where Where did you go to a circus? No, nah, they were all over Mexico, Kurt. It's the coolest thing to do on a Sunday evening. Okay, well... That might be a byproduct of growing up in Mexico, Luis. I don't know how many... Sir, I mean, I lived by a lot of farms. I guess I lived in a sort of very boring circus because it's just like cows standing mm. around in fields. It's not a three-ring circus, right? It was just like a field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just a one-pen well, circus. <laughs> right. Now, in 1898, there was a, a man, Sparks, Charlie Sparks' father, he actually purchased a elephant, okay? Ooh, how, and, and where does one purchase an elephant from? Is there an those, elephant vendor at this point in time? I mean, most likely, Kurt. Circuses were all the rage. If there isn't an elephant involved in, or like an elephant black market, I wouldn't be surprised. And, and to be honest... You just gotta find the right guy in the right alley. He opens his trench coat, and there's some pristine elephants ready to go for the right price. And interestingly, there probably wasn't a black market. Surely everyone on the street corner was just selling elephants. <laughs> Regardless, in 1898, Sparks and his family purchases an elephant uh, who was four years old at the time and named this elephant Mary. Okay. okay. So Mary, the Asian elephant. Now, this this man, Charlie Sparks, didn't really have a child. He didn't have children. So he and his wife somehow raised this elephant as their own. Wow. Right. But that's a romanticized story because if you're using that child as you know your main source of income how much of a child can it be that's yeah just, also uh, like didn't they have to train the elephant like you know they gotta like whip or cattle prod their child at some point that seems i don't know maybe people who were doing that to their kids in that point in time who knows <laughs> some would argue that people were doing that to their kids in mexico around the time that i was born so who knows? <laughs> now, Another byproduct of growing up in Mexico. <laughs> no, it's just a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them, Kurt. Now, one of interesting thing about Mary is that as she continued to grow, she could, became the main attraction of the Sparks World Famous Show because she was huge. And they would advertise Mary the Elephant as a um, huge elephant that was able to she was able to play 25 tunes on the musical horns without missing a note what she was Did also, they make like a like a custom horn for an elephant or is it like a regular trumpet probably just put horns in a line and <laughs> have her honk the horns with her trunk right oh the order yeah she was yeah. also supposed to be able to be a really good baseball pitcher oh. <laughs> so there was a baseball routine where she would grab the ball with her trunk and toss them. Wow, I wonder how fast an elephant can pitch. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I assume that our listeners don't know this, but I played quite a lot of baseball growing mm -hmm. up and I was a pitcher. So now I'm just thinking about like, could yeah. an elephant throw a curveball? <sighs> is an elephant throwing like 60? Like, right, what is an yeah. elephant pitching? Holy cow, yeah, I need to hit yeah, some batting you know, practice off an elephant. She had a 400 batting average, Kurt. Whoa, so. <laughs> Hall of yeah. Famer Mary. <laughs> Just so you're aware. Holy you know. cow, dude. <laughs> All this to say, she was the star of the show because of course being a circus owner you have several different elephants so mary was just one of the elephants around but she could do all of this and she also was advertised to be the biggest animal in the world even bigger three inches bigger than the world famed jumbo who if you don't know about jumbo oh take that jumbo jumbo was pt barnum's famous elephant right so pt barnum had jumbo Ooh. who we would who would later down the line inspire the name dumbo right so dumbo is a play on jumbo mm. a famous elephant now what are they what are they measuring by is it by like weight or height or height yeah, oh, man. she yeah, was they gotta three like, taller. P.T. Barnum's got to get like some high heels for Jumbo now or something. I mean, this is like that's right. This is throwing down the gauntlet in the circus world. I feel. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's weird because I think like 
these circusy things are one of the parts of American history that feel kind of like a weird dream that we all <laughs> yeah. had. Yeah. You know, like it seems like this didn't really happen, right? But mm-hmm. I, somehow mm-hmm. I innately know that like this means some real business in the circus. Big, world. big news in the circus world, Mary was. You know, and Mary was really a star, right? She was at this point, mm-hmm. since she had been purchased, she was now around 30 years old, right? Oh, wow. So she was just a huge elephant going crazy, okay? Now, she was also worth a, a fortune, like $20,000 at the time, which is way... That's a lot of money. In, in, in 1916, right? So yeah, she was huge, literally and figuratively. Now, things went as usual in the circus, in the traveling show. Then, one day, they arrived to East Tennessee, okay? Oh, yeah. East Tennessee, specifically the little town of Kingsport, for a show. Now, at these traveling shows, Kurt, I don't know if you're familiar, but not all of the employees or all of the handlers in these shows would be traveling together along with the circus. You, you can imagine that it would be a lot of money to keep a permanent crew, you know, cover the housing, feeding uh, of not just the animals, but also the workers that come with you to these circus shows. Mm, yeah. So a lot of these traveling circus companies, what they would do is that they would stomp into different towns and essentially sign up contractors to work different jobs and different helpers throughout the show. Right, the laborers. Now, yeah. that's right, that's right. Now, here in Kingsport, Tennessee, they hired a man, a man named Red Eldridge, okay? Oh, yeah. Come on, Red Eldridge, yeah. Red Eldridge was a day laborer, right? He was going from town to town seeking jobs, and he was hired for that night's show in Kingsport to be a elephant handler, Okay. Oh, they they're hiring the elephant handler yes. locally. Yes. In Tennessee, That's Red right. Eldridge, a man who has no doubt dealt with many elephants in his time yep. living in East Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good luck, Mary. I don't like where this is going, so but this man proceed. He was hired his ass. His prior job was janitor, so he was well trained, of course, to be an elephant handler. <laughs> Not just any elephant, but the biggest elephant in the world. Right now. He was trained. Wow, okay. He was given enough training to know that he needed to be gentle, treat the elephants with care, and make sure that they didn't wreak any havoc, right? Now, the story goes as follows. Eldritch, Red Eldritch, he is on top of the elephant, or next to the elephant. He is leading this elephant in one shape or form to the place Uh, The the watering hole where the elephants would uh, get their water. Mm. As they're going toward it, as they're moving that way, Mary sees a piece of watermelon on the ground. Okay. She stops, curious, interested in it. She goes down to pick up the the watermelon piece. At this point, Red Eldritch essentially says, hey, get up. We're going to the water hole. Don't get distracted. You can't just stay here. So he uses the hook, the bull hook, the cow hook he was using to, which is essentially just like a stick with a metal prod at the end, to hit Mary to get her attention for her to get going. And the story says that at this point, Mary became enraged. She grabbed Red, she, she wrapped Red Eldridge with her trunk, flung him against a building, ran towards him, and stomped on the man's head. Oh! Immediately killing Red Eldritch. Wow, she did not play around. Do not get between Mary and a watermelon. Hold. That's God. right. That's right. At this point, of course, everyone's coming through. Charlie Sparks, the the owner of the Sparks World Famous Show, he tries to go to comfort Mary, but at this point, the crowd is going wild. The crowd begins to start yelling, "Kill the elephant!" Kill the elephant. Oh, that was part of the show, guys. That's It's a stunt. There's a story that one man even unloaded his entire pistol to Mary, but the bullets were not big enough to go through her thick hide. And so there was just this enraged elephant that had just killed a man in front of an entire crowd running wild through the streets of East Tennessee. And then just deflected several bullets. Now, yeah. Mary's unstoppable, dude. <laughs> That's right. Now, Kingsport officials uh, quickly, quote, arrested unquote Mary, right? So what they did, they chained her up somehow 
and they chained her outside of the local county jail. <laughs> and at this point, get her a lawyer. You, right? Does she get a phone call? Uh, who knows? Who knows? Um, that she got peanuts? Definitely not. Mm. At this point, you know, Mary had now gained a reputation. Mary was a felon, a convicted felon. Stone cold that. killer. Stone dude. cold killer. Don't mess with her. So from this moment on, everyone started naming her Murderous Mary. Oh, no. It fit too well. Because this event had been so publicized, Kurt, in, in a public space and, right, and, and killed a person, newspapers started reporting on this fact and became huge national story where she gained the moniker nationwide of Murderous Mary and it spread like wildfire across not just Tennessee but the entire country. And, you know, back in these times, early 1900s, if an elephant killed your handler, which is something, you know, relatively common, mm -hmm. you would just sell the elephant and forget about her, right. their crimes. They're not your problem anymore. So at this point, you couldn't sell this elephant considering that your elephant murderous Mary now has international, well, not international, but national reputation. No right? one's going to buy murderous Mary. That's right. So at this point, her next stop, the next stop of the of the circus was going to be in Johnson City, Tennessee, and the mayor of Johnson City actually decided to ban the Sparks World Famous shows <laughs> from entering the city because of murderous Mary's atrocities. So different wow. cities actually they started, canceled yeah, Mary. Yeah, they canceled Mary. No she was way, the victim dude. of the woke mob. However, Kurt, it does Man. get worse because now Charlie Sparks has to make a decision about his family business, right? All of these different talents and, and the different talents in his uh, right. towns in his tour are canceling their appearances because you have Murderous Mary as part of your troupe. So he's like, okay, I can't really do anything. Right. Th there, there's one th thing killing his business, and it's literally the killer, Mary, right? It's so, Mary. That's right. He's got to choose between between his, his life's dream or Mary. That's right. That's right. So after this... Charlie makes a decision. In Charlie Sparks' quest for redemption to redeem his show and his world-famous show so he could travel once again, he decided that Murderous Mary had to be put down. No! However, you must recall that she's a murderer. She can't be put down in any old way. She's not going what? down without a fight. What do murderers get as their sentence in early 1900s Tennessee, Kurt? Hang her! They decide to hang no. Mary. So, no. in the nearby what? town of Irwin, Tennessee, there was a railroad station and a railroad central, right? So, they had this huge, I, mean, I guess you could call it a, a huge car that had a crane on it. Mm -hmm. I believe they're called derricks, right? And they decided that this was going to be a proper place to carry this five-ton elephant and be able to hold. They decided this was the logical they, thing They to decided do. the most humane way to kill this elephant was to hang it. Oh, yeah. Um, humane, and, I bet. Are they charging admission? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're charging admission, but it became the talk of the town, naturally, you know? Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, not everyone was excited about this event, right? Some people were nervous that the elephant could become further enraged, go into a rampage. And so they even evacuated the nearby town buildings. Wow. And one rail worker even said, I don't want any part of this, right? This is going to haunt me for the rest of my days. So I don't want any. So, yeah, how, how many people were objecting based on, like, this is a terrible thing to do? And how many were objecting based on, like, when this fails, I don't want to be in the line of people getting trampled. I think it was more of the <laughs> latter than the former. You know, there's only, I'm telling you this story, <laughs> that there was only a single person that said that I didn't want to be there. Everyone else, of course, wanted to see them hang this elephant. Honestly, I'm impressed that there's anyone who was like, I'm standing out on principle. Right. So what they did is that they chained her up by the feet and then they got a big, chain and change her up by her neck and little by little they started racing this elephant into the air oh they, they started, started hoisting. hoisting mary the murderous mary up in the air but like no, we said it was self-defense you know it's it's the problem is that stand your ground self-defense mary doesn't have the same ring to it 
you know, <laughs> and she had that public defender lawyer hack yeah. when they yeah. had her tied up down there at the jail who probably couldn't do anything with it. Stand your ground, Mary, does not have the same ring. <laughs> it didn't. No, no, it didn't. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, of course, murderous Mary, she was not going to go out without a fight, you know? Good. Now, she starts kicking out. She starts going crazy. At this point, the chains in her feet start pulling her tendons and things, right? The chain mm. holding her neck even breaks, and she falls a good 10 to 15 feet onto the ground. Okay. Right now, she she hits the ground hard. She's dazed, confused. Some people said that she was kind of sitting like a rabbit because of how she fell. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's it's not I'm not going to great detail, but you know eventually they did get a new chain. They hoisted her once again up in the air, and oh. she fully was off of the ground. You can imagine an elephant hanging from the neck, hanging like fifteen feet off the ground, right? And in the middle of Tennessee, in the middle of East Tennessee, in the town of Irwin, Tennessee, and she was hanged until eventually a vet came by and said yeah uh, yeah that's that's a dead elephant right till eventually a very brave vet climbed <laughs> up there to check yeah. her pulse yeah and uh that's the story of how mary murderous mary was hanged eventually as the town grew oh, and poor mary and, and you know the craziest part is that to this day some lucky reporter was able to be there and snag a picture of murderous mary in her final moments so oh, out there wow I am so out tempted there to Google in the world, right Kurt, now. <laughs> out there in the world exists a picture of an elephant hanging from a crane. Pl- please don't Google it and ruin your day because this might be, mm. you know, a fake story. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Uh, but yeah, that's the story of Mary. Sweet, sweet Mary. While all she wanted to do was eat a watermelon off Mary. the ground. And that ended up being hanged. She didn't deserve this. Did not deserve it. No, did not deserve it. And you know what's crazier? The town of Irwin, Tennessee. Tell me. Now, because of this reputation, years down the line, decided to found an elephant sanctuary. Are you... Ki- Let it go, Irwin, Tennessee. You you didn't do good you with know, the one elephant you had. Don't try to convince people to give you more. All the different elephants in Irwin, Tennessee. But that's the story, Kurt. Their local elementary school is definitely like the Irwin elephants. <laughs> the murderous elephants of Irwin. The murderous Marys. Murderous Marys. Yeah, not bad a name. <laughs> wow. that You know, that just makes me think that now we have one more Mary to add to our, our ever-growing list of ill-fated Marys. Even stretching back all the way to the beginning of this podcast, we had Typhoid Mary... And then we had Mary Toft, who birthed a whole bunch of rabbits, and the Mary Celeste ship, which was found missing all its crew, and now we have Murderous Mary as well. So the the Choose Your Mary list grows ever longer, Luis, um, which I'm happy about that, but that, that's pretty much where my happy parts stop because, you know, aside from, like, the fact that I'm not really sure you can fault an elephant for attacking someone who whacked her with a, with a cattle prod. Like, obviously, this is... A really awful thing that this elephant ended up anywhere near East Tennessee to start with. So, man, I just feel bad for Mary all the way. I really wanted to be rooting for her at the end, but I was like, on this podcast, there's no way Mary's right, yeah. busting out of here. I think this is this yeah. So you know, Mary. you know, we can't all have a story, a happy ending story. You know, sadly, and this one was really not too happy mm-hmm. of a tale. So were there were there elephants at the the zoo you went to in your childhood, Luis? Did you see any any potential murderous Marys down yeah, in Mexico? You know, I will say when I was a little boy and the circus would come to town, I I would get to ride on top of an elephant. Wow, so, they actually had an elephant. Yeah, that's pretty. They crazy. actually had an elephant there. So you know, for me, this is a if anything a nostalgic tale. I, I was never personally part of an official public hanging of an elephant. That is a little <laughs> beyond my scope of of at least where I lived, but I did. That's not a byproduct of Mexico. <laughs> not not, not sur- surprisingly. You know, <laughs> actually not surprisingly. If many if any country would hang an elephant, it would be the US. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's true. It's just it's just wild enough to happen in East Tennessee, you know. It's just it's just a, a crazy enough thing that when you yeah. when you're driving through town in East Tennessee and you see they're hanging an elephant down by the railroad tracks, you're just like, oh okay. Must be Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Must be Tuesday over here in 19th century East Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kurt. 
So this next story, you know, I, I hate to have started the show with a animal cruelty story. Oh, don't tell me like, we're going we down really... from elephant hanging. Surely we yeah, got to be yeah. going up from elephant hanging. Well, I think that's going to be up to you to decide, because if I'm going to be terribly oh. honest with you, Kurt, this is also going to be an animal cruelty story, but not in the way you expect, okay? In this story, two elephants are hanged. No, just you wait. Just you wait. <laughs> So, Curtis... Maybe it's going to be elephant on elephant crime. Ooh, that'd be complex. Who knows? It's a, it's a complicated issue. It's a complicated issue to this day. You know, the pro-elephant lobbyist, big elephant, is trying to hide this from all of you. Big, big, huge elephant. <laughs> big, huge elephant. Yeah. Three inches bigger than P.T. Barnum's jumbo. <laughs> when we say big elephant, we just mean the one big one. The big elephant. <laughs> the, the big elephant. <laughs> now, Kurt, you're familiar with jobs. Right? Like the concept of labor and working, yes? I've heard of it before, yeah. Some could argue that you're not. I would not do that, Kurt, because I love (laughs) you. I know you are familiar with this. But, you know, throughout human history, we've used different animals to help us out with some work, you know? Of course, domesticated animals uh, immediately come to mind. Animals that we used to ride, like horses. Animals we used to eat. I'm not going to name all the animals we eat. I think you all know. Mm -hmm. But what animal do we not often think about when we think about laborers or animal laborers? Uh, That's monkeys, which, you know, or primates, which if we're being fully honest, Kurt. Are we going back to the circus? No, we're not going back to the circus. And that's a crazy (laughs) part because monkeys and primates are very similar to us, right? To the point where, you know, they are fast learners and they have a lot of the same digitation and and fingers that we have so they can be used for things that humans just cannot do or something that that sorry something that humans exclusively can do okay for example some monkey jobs in the past kurt coconut gatherers so for example up in thailand uh, they send monkeys up to go get coconuts to palm trees uh, to bring them down because that's a little too dangerous for uh, humans to do that's nice that i'm okay with that one i feel like maybe the monkeys could enjoy that like like that could be a job that Maybe the, the monkey doesn't even realize they're working. They're just like, hey, I like getting these coconuts. That's right. And, you know, also other monkeys have been trained to collect money. For example, if you're out busking in the street, they have been trained to go out and collect money to bring you back your money if you're busking. That was also a tradition here in Mexico. So that's something that did happen. They were employed here in Mexico. Uh, again, I feel like, you know, that's that's yeah, fine. It's just an extra like, extension like n- neutrally you. ethical here, you know? Right. But of course they've been. I've never seen any any monkeys in the wild busking, <laughs> but I imagine they don't they don't mind a little, yeah, little right, fetch right. too much. Fetch quest, yeah. Now, they've also been, of course, been stars of the show, like actors. You know, we all know the great movie Bedtime with Bonzo. Oh, Bedtime for <laughs> um, Bonzo. Starring yes. a young union, SAG after union member, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> alongside a primate, a chimpanzee. This is, this is just a just a, a piece of knowledge i want all our listeners to know when luis and i lived together bedtime for bonzo probably came up like once a week that's right like a a lot bedtime for bonzo came up i think it (laughs) i think there was more talk about bedtime for bonzo than when that movie came out that's so true but of course we're keeping we're keeping it right yeah you know so they've been actors and some would argue that their highest accomplishment that primates have had is that being astronauts so Oh, um, so true. Primates were the first astronauts that the U.S. ever sent to space. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy if you think about that. Like a monkey was in space before humans were in space that we know of. Th- big, big on you guys. Big on primates. Frankly, like the monkeys were there first. Now, Kurt, I'm going to tell you about another job that this monkey had, and uh, that is the job of executioner. Oh yes, this one the monkeys <laughs> love. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> We're going to go to England, to Great Britannia, in the year of our Lord, 1859. Okay? Good year. 1859, we got the birth of a man named Henry Pierpoint. Okay? Now, Henry Pierpoint was a executioner by trade. Why was he an executioner? Because he was born into an executioner family, right? Is that how that worked? Well... You know, back in the day, you actually had had caste or more defined social systems in Europe, and one of them was the executioner caste, and the executioner mm, caste did not allow right. you to meet with other castes. But, I mean, that's far away 
uh, we're talking about the 1800s, where this specific caste system is gone, okay. but executioners are just another profession, like another worker of the state. But of course, if your father's an executioner, most likely you're going to be an executioner, right? Right, right. It's all he knows. It's a family trade. Well, funny enough, his father... He was raised as a cobbler, so someone that makes or fixes shoes. But he really, really, really wanted to be an executioner. So he would start to fix society. Yeah, he, he would started shadowing his local executioner from his town and his local hangman until he eventually took over the position of hangman. And that's how his son went into the trade. Not just his son, but you know, also his other son, which was Henry's brother Thomas. They were both official hangmen for the state. Right, so all of these different municipalities. You know, maybe maybe we should still have it work like that, because I, I mean, you got to be a uh, a really specific person who's really set in their goals to be like, hey, yeah, I'm working on shoes, but I'd really like to be in the killing people job. <laughs> that sure right. would be neato to transfer to. Right. I feel like you know, if it's gonna happen either way, we could at least get like five or six individuals who maybe need that outlet yeah, safely and yeah. ethically and let them do it but you know so th- 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 this is basically to say that at this point mid-1800s kurt executioners and ex- official execution mostly by hanging is um like a common thing right so mm. these are often like public events too where people go and visit these executions We've talked. Oh yeah, down by the yeah, yeah, yeah. We've. I think we've personally talked about <laughs> a case where in Paris, France, um, Mr. Casanova, you know, the famed Casanova, he was in Paris and he writes about people went insane for public executions. They would love it. They would rent out balconies that would face the middle of the of where the gallows were to watch this take place. You got to see him wriggle. So okay, I mean that's yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I guess so. Now. There were different types of executions at this point, right? right? Throughout history, there's been plenty, including being drawn and quartered to, of course, being being broken by the wheel, which actually you grab the wheel of a cart and drop it onto someone's extremities until they break and then you kill them. Oh. Yeah, very brutal ways of killing. You know, of course, beheading was a huge one back in medieval times. Right. Always a classic. Classic. But at this point, we have the... Um, the easiest way of execution, which is by hanging. Now, hanging... The humane way, where you drop them till their neck breaks so they choke to death. Well, I don't know if you if humane is the word, Kurt, but I think it's the most... Compared to drop a big wheel on them. Well, I was going to say, it's the most <laughs> cost-effective way to kill someone. Ah, because wh- what do you that's need? True. Just a tree and some rope, right? So there were that's different true. types of executions by hanging, specifically, which was... You know, there was one called the inverted L, meaning, you know, imagine you're playing the game Hangman and it's literally just an inverted mm-hmm. L and you're hanging someone from that. Also, the classic one of so- hanging someone from a tree. I guess we could also say from hanging someone from, you know, a crane on a train. Uh, so that's also something that... Known to have been used at least once. At, at least once, yeah. Um, we won't <laughs> specify to which animal. But, you know, the biggest way that people were executed was through the gallows. Now, what are gallows? For those of you that don't know, this was a wooden structure, a platform that was built out either outside the town or inside the town in a public space. And it was a structure specifically built for the public execution of someone. Now, you would either have some permanent gallows that you built out of stone and wood, maybe some temporary gallows that you could move around, And then eventually, in the mid to late 1800s, you started to get the development of what we would call drop gallows. I think you can imagine what these are. Is this where the the floor, they got the trap door piece? That's right. Now, drop gallows, before the drop gallows were invented by a Frenchman, actually, people would just stand on a chair or, you know, just be raised up by their neck, right? Now, with the invention of the drop gallows, a trap door would open beneath the execution person's, sorry, the execution victim's feet, and the drop would kill you by breaking your neck rather than just be by killing you by asphyxiation, right? So it was considered... Oh, I see. Right, yeah. yeah. Typically, it would be asphyxiation, but sometimes asphyxiation could take up to 40 minutes in some cases, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I I hadn't thought about that, that... Like if they just lift you up, that it's definitely not going to break your neck because your your own body weight Certainly. wouldn't really do that. Yeah, and it I definitely Certainly, have heard yeah. before that if if you 
when people were hung that if they would break their neck from the fall, then you're in like a matter of a 10 second death as opposed to like a multi minute death. So, you know, drop gallows, huge invention. <laughs> yeah. Revolutionized hangman, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Much like I feel like it does add some showmanship to it, you know. It's like when you're at the, I guess so. in the water slide and they got like the the floor that drops out beneath you, and you're you're waiting <laughs> to do it. Like like the crowd can you know kind of wait for right. anticipation. It's kind of like when the guillotine took over uh, official executioners ex- executioners jobs would chop off your head. It's automation about of the whole process. They're taking your jobs. Mm. Now moving on, the real victims here, <laughs> the little guy. <laughs> so back to Henry. This next sentence is going to be very confusing, but I think you're going to really like okay. it. At some point, at some point Henry came into the possession of a capuchin monkey. Now, what's a capuchin monkey? If you've seen movies like The Hangover or maybe Night at the Museum, it's these fairly small, probably like 3 feet tall, mm-hmm. maybe even shorter these little monkeys who, uh, you know, they're pretty docile. They're very easily trained. This man procured one. No one knows how. Some rumors say that he went on a trip to Australia where he bought it from a local vendor, which sounds very strange to, that Australia would just have this amount of monkeys ready to sell. <laughs> Others say that this was an escaped animal from the local, from the local zoo. Oh, and that he just kind of took it and kept it, yeah, and ran with it. But they're like they're like the little monkeys that still kind of have like long arms and legs, right? Because I know there's there's monkeys that are really small where they're almost more like a squirrel or something. Not not like a squirrel, but where they don't have like humanoid figure exactly. This is not like a spider monkey, right? This is more of a one of these little apes that look more like a human than not, right? Again, if you look up capuchin monkey. You'll see there's been plenty, like Night at the Museum, The Hangover, maybe even if you've watched the show Community. Oh, yeah. They're the little mischievous monkey that's, that's right. like always stealing stuff and running away with it in the movie. Exactly. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like like the monkey that the pirates always have, too. That's I right. Feel like. yeah. yeah, okay. I'm so, with it. I'm with you it. know, well. This is a very, very good monkey for someone to have. <laughs> it is a good just... monkey. So, well, we don't really know how this man got it, but Henry himself would always said that he doesn't remember a time without the monkey and quote doesn't want a future without him <laughs> so um uh, yeah. this man needs to be a politician what a good answer they're like did you steal this monkey and he's like you know right. i really can't remember what life was like without this yeah that's <laughs> right and he said i don't want to imagine a future without him let my good friend in a sense i've always known this monkey in a way <laughs> He's always been around. Now this this monkey and I are spiritually soul bound, and we first met many past lives ago in the Roman Colosseum. <laughs> if you recall, Kurt, this man was an executioner. Okay, and I'm glad you mentioned that that pirates sometimes carried these monkeys because Henry would carry this monkey, whose name, by the way, was Patters. P-A-T-T-E-R-S. Ooh. Patters the monkey. Good name. Good name for little Patters. He would he was always seen around Henry's shoulder, his neck, or following close behind him. So eventually he started working as the official executioner of Rutland Prison, right? Rutland Prison is in this town called nice. Oakham. Which um Oakham is I don't know, like a little north of London, so up in the fields, in the middle of nowhere, really. It's it's a <laughs> historical town, but okay. nothing really important happened there. But there's a big prison there where they would send some of the most imp- important London prisoners that were not able to stay in the city or, you know, Australia. They sent them to Rutland Prison. Mm. He started working there, and he was earning the following, which was one guinea per week. That doesn't sound like a lot. And one guinea per execution. So oh, one wait, guinea was uh, he's got like a he works on commission. He's getting he's getting paid extra for yeah. per so, per client. <laughs> yes. So so he has his base pay and then he also has future pay. Mm. I guess commission, yeah, you could yeah, yeah. call it. Yeah. Per execution he would get another bit of money. So since this place was a place where they would send some of the most dangerous uh criminals, 
they had a reputation of having a good amount of of executions, mm, right? And not only booming. that, but this was one of the first places that officially had one of this new technologies that was the drop gallows, right? To the point where a drop gallows started being nicknamed the Rutland gallows mm. because this was so... I mean, this was the place that started popularizing it and using Cutting it. Cutting edge executions. That's right. I'm sure the prisoners were thrilled about that. Oh, they loved it, Kurt. They really <laughs> They're were. They're like, we're going to be we're going to be executed in the most futuristic way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Kurt, I would love to go on and tell you uh, what these executions look like, but surely you want an insider's perspective. Mm. Now, in 1890, so right around the birth of Murderous Mary, the journalist. <laughs> John Scarborough, he was working for the Morning Herald and also the Time, the London Time. He visited Rutland Prison and he described the following, and I quote this, Rutland Prison, not unlike other such institutions across Britannia, has erected their gallows directly in the center of the recreation courtyard. Ominous. So, you know, gives you an idea Mm -hmm. of what this looks like. He continues, quote, On mornings most grim, when the clouds loom over as omens of the hanging to come. That's nice. Kind of fun, right? More ominous. We're going well. The prisoners gather around the foreboding structure, a new innovation of the time, as the hangman now operates a false door below the prisoners' feet. So, of course, he's talking about the drop gallows, right? Mm Mm-hmm. The force of this, quote, Rutland drop, as it is often called, achieves separation of the vertebra, facilitating a gloved decapitation. A gloved decapitation? That's right. So, Wow, uh, look at my man with the journalism work. I looked into gloved decapitation, and have you ever heard of degloving, Kurt? Degloving, no. It's whenever you kind of, you lose an extremity, but you... But, you know, it's all separate from the inside. Oh, okay. So, you know, a glove decapitation means that essentially you break your neck, right? Your head is still Ah, attached. I see. But everything inside has separated. It's not connected anymore, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense now. Now, he continues. As the crowd prepares for the final hour of departure, a murmur grows into a roar. Pats, pats, pats. Here he comes, pats, 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 patter. When a peculiar beast, dressed in the most grim and sober hunting wear, appears as if escorting Mr. Pierpoint, who will carry out justice on this day. Yes. Oh, this is So, this tiny little capuchin monkey, dressed to the nines, man, like, like, he says the best hunting wear, right? So, he shows up ready... To kill. Dress mm-hmm. to kill. Dress to kill. Now, executions continue in the regular manner. He's an executioner, so he's the only one really allowed to pull the lever, or in this case, the rope that opens the door to the Rutland drop. So the monkey would just be hanging around. So so Patter can't he, he can't pull the lever? No, he cannot pull the lever. However, Kurt, oh. Patter would screech when it was time. So Patter determined Patter determined no. when when he would have to pull this rope to open the trap door, right? And once no, Patter. the trap door opened, Patter would run and scurry below the trap door to collect any items that would fall from the prisoner's person. Not only that, but he would also grab their shoes and their socks. This, this seems weird or maybe trivial, but beyond the payment that the base payment of one guinea per week and one guinea per execution that Pierpoint would receive, the executioner would receive extra money by selling the victim's belongings. So he would sell... Mm, and he knows what to do with those shoes, former cobbler. Well, no, his dad's with the cobbler. Come on. Yeah. Patter would grab the shoes, he would grab the socks and bring them back because he would eventually also sell those. Does Patter pull the gold teeth out of their mouth too? Man, he's a hard <sighs> criminal. Basically... And interestingly enough, too, another practice of the time is that the executioner would sell the rope that the victims were hanged on. Different amounts, depending on how much rope you wanted. Both because because rope was an expensive thing at this point, but also because people had morbid curiosity. They wouldn't reuse the rope? At times they would, 
Kurt, but uh, again, uh, you know, this was one of the executioner's way of earning money. Mm, so it, it would have been, it, it wouldn't have been in every single case, but maybe a big execution where yeah. you could sell this as a souvenir, right? But anyway, there was a whole business around this. Interestingly, after the story of Patter the Monkey became famous nationwide because of this reporter, because of John Scarborough, people started approaching people started approaching Henry with offers to buy this monkey or to see him perform. And not just any person, but people such as circus owners would go and try to get this monkey, including P.T. Barnum and oh. Charlie Sparks, who learned of this and tried to secure this monkey, this little capuchin monkey, as part of their their traveling show. Yeah, of course. That's right up their alley, the, the executioner yeah. monkey. Wh to which Henry, he never accepted a single offer. Good. In in the slightest. No, not only did he love Patters, because, you know, he's known his whole life, essentially. Right. But he genuinely really liked being an executioner. He said, this is job security for me, man. Like, I'm done. I'm set. Seems and like Patter likes being an executioner, too, to be yeah, honest. That's right. Yeah. And so this man would always be seen, as John Scarborough continues in his story, he would often be seen sitting in the corner of the prison courtyard, smoking a pipe with Patter at his shoulder, mm. sharing of this set pipe. <laughs> That's a nice scene. So this man was just smoking along with this monkey. Now, famously, Patter dies. You know, as much as we don't want him to, Patter is not immortal. And in 1920... Sorry, mm -hmm. in 1900, oh, he dies. So tragic becomes news. However, <laughs> now, two years later, Henry also dies. 1902, he also dies. And funny enough, he dies of cirrhosis of the liver. Now, while cirrhosis of the liver was a popular way or a common way to die back in the day. All the rage. My personal head theory, my head canon, is that this man drank himself to death after the death of his he monkey. died of a broken heart. And the best part is this, Kurt. In the 27-year-long career that Henry Pierpoint was an executioner for, he executed around 250 people, mm -hmm. and 125 of those were accompanied, assisted even, by Patter. Now, Kurt. Yes, Patter. This is not where the story ends. Because oh? his son, his son, Albert Pierpoint, was... Oh, not Patter's son. No, I was no, like, no, the, no. the, the, no, the no. son oh, of the Capuchin. Oh, yes. Now he's the executioner. you got to follow in his father's footsteps. That's all he That's knows. Right. Now, his son, Albert Pierpoint, followed in his father's footsteps. He also became an executioner. Nice. He knew from an early age that he wanted to become a hangman, seeing as his father and Patter, you know, who wouldn't? doing this. Who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> Eventually, his son executed between 400 and 600 people in the 25-year career, and he was the last great official hangman of Britain, dying in 1992. Wow, that's... so. That's really late. That's really, really late. So yeah. if you think about like the degrees of separation between yeah. uh, the, this moment right now, either that we're recording this or you are mm -hmm. listening to this audience member yeah. and this scene of like they're marching the prisoner out and everyone's like, patter, patter. And then a monkey screeches and they pull the rope and the trap door goes out. There's like, I mean, 1992, that's that's the modern era, you know? There's there's only one generation in between that and iPhones, and that's yeah, insane. So, you know, interestingly, he his son, Albert Pierpoint, was one of the main executioners for Britain during the Second World War, for which he hanged a lot of mm. Nazis and members of the Nazi party or uh, that had committed war crimes. If only Patter could have seen that. If only Patter could have seen this just... To what extent his legacy <laughs> would extend, Kurt, right? And with that, the story of Patter, the monkey executioner, comes to an end. Oh, Patter. You know, I, I like at least that uh, I, I was worried that we had more animal cruelty on the horizon. It is animal cruelty, but the animal is the one performing it is. the this cruelty. Is, 
That's right. That's right. It's the, he's he's the the crueler as opposed to the cruelly in this case. Uh, that's right. Yeah. It it is nice to see the the animals get a little bit of vengeance uh, in in the second act here. So so that don't that was see fun. It often. Don't yeah, see it and, often. Yeah, and and you know, and he went out. I, I guess it sounds like peacefully. I mean, we don't we don't know the details. It seems like, but it wasn't at least notably terrible. He wasn't hung from a railroad car. We know that. Yeah, you know things change. That wouldn't happen until some years later. Once Patter died, things went downhill for animals in hanging. You know, back in the day, they used to hang. That's true. And, you know, Patter was never forced to perform a baseball routine on command in East Tennessee. So he at least had that going for him. That's right. Uh, it could have could have certainly been worse. <laughs> yeah, it, it could it could have been better, too. But, you know, you choose your battles. Yeah, yeah. Was there like any resistance to this guy using the capuchin monkey in his his executioning, or were people just like okay with this? Because I mean, I guess he's still yeah, getting the I job mean, done, he right? He was the executioner, so he just had a pet, right? <laughs> right, right. And and you know, as There's, executioner, you know, there was a rule that only you were allowed to carry it out, right? You had the quote experience to do this, right? Yeah, so that's true. You know, I think it goes back to that. It's in like this kind of magical time period where it's it's just close enough in history that you know if you go like really long ago to being thinking about like the greeks or the roman empire or the egyptians or something you're like well that's like way back in history but just a little bit back in history is where it's like it's almost yeah. modern society but then there's something extremely bizarre going on like a monkey executioner but everybody's just like that's right oh no you know it's just tuesday over here in rutledge prison we got the monkey executioner <laughs> All right, Kurt. Well, those were the two stories of animal cruelty, of animal and hanging. Interestingly, both coming together with joint, uh, the joint common thing of execution and the circus. So, you know, for whatever that's worth. That's true. Capital punishment and also capitalism. Yeah, capital punishment and animals. Meet me at the crossroads. <laughs> and, and you know, there was, there was almost an overlap, too, because they were... They were right next to each other in history. But if we if we add my fast fact in, Luis, then we have just one cohesive timeline where we go monkey executions to elephant performances to tomato based ketchup. That's true. Ketchup. That's and I true. Think that's really beautiful. That's really beautiful. You know, really makes you believe in miracles, huh? It does. It you know, it gives you a little little hope. A little hope for the for the animal cruelty world that they <laughs> maybe they got it right after all. Maybe. <laughs> and maybe. on that spirit, <laughs> let's I think move on to our favorite least favorite part of this podcast which is deliberation. deliberation. Okay, Luis, r- remind me of the, the two circuses you just told me about. Well, Kurt, the first story, the one you just heard, was, of course, of Patter the Executioner's Monkey, little capuchin boy who would screech at the time mm. when death's door was right in front of the victim and died, sadly, after being an old, old monkey with a 120 kill count body count Mm. and the first story you've heard was the tragic story of mary who was punished for just being a little hungry you know she was a little hungry in a town decided to go up in arms and eventually hang her for her crimes of stomping on a man's head gaining her the nickname of (laughs) murderous mary so what do you think kurt hanged for turning red eldritch into a pancake hanged for making Irwin, Tennessee a household name <laughs> should be thanking yeah. her, frankly. Uh, okay. All right. Well, let me talk about, about my, my girl murders Mary first. Oh man. You know, I don't know if you've seen the movie nightmare alley, Louise, but just cause I was kind of a, it, they've got some depictions of early, uh, America 20th century circuses. So I was, I was thinking about that and it's, it's funny how like circuses are supposed to be such a joyous thing. And then looking back, it's kind of like, they seem really dark and cruel and terrifying but you know it is always interesting to get like a glimpse into that time period because like i said if it feels like a weird dream that we all collectively had and as bizarre as it is to get to this situation where you've got the potentially the world's largest elephant doing a baseball routine in east tennessee that's exactly the stuff that did happen so i i don't i don't doubt that at all uh in any way um i also don't doubt that you could end up in a situation where you're you know, kind of running your circus haphazardly and you got old Red Eldritch out there taking care of an elephant that's never seen him before and he whacks her with a cattle prod and that doesn't go well. Uh, you know, that that all seems like it's crazy, but 
by American history standards, yeah, that's that is just kind of a regular Tuesday. Um, and and as sad as it is, this this scene of uh, them hanging quote unquote murderous Mary at the railroad tracks is so striking. I, I can't tell if it's you know because I can picture it so vividly, or if it, it feels like maybe I've seen this picture you're referring to before. So when you were talking about that, I kind of had the flash of that image in my mind because, you know, I'm assuming that if you ever see a picture of a, of a elephant being hung by the railroad tracks, you don't forget that. So it does seem vaguely familiar. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> you pretty much like, uh, you're a clean slate after every day. It's like, like total recall for you every morning. That's true. You know, it's, it's like 50 days of summer. Wait, no, that's not, it's like, it's like 51st States. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I was kind of I was kind of sitting on that, that I was like, OK. Th- yeah. And also, I know that you love these old classic Americana stories. And so I would not at all put it past you to be able to come up with a really good one, especially one that's this combination of tragic and bizarre. Um, but, you know, I had I had kind of the elephant picture on my mind while I was listening to the second story. And then we got to this depiction of the execution where the prisoners are chanting for patter <laughs> and he comes out I, I already when they were chanting i was like "Uh oh this is bad because this seems really real <laughs> i'm really bought in on this and you know we've talked before louise about it's it's weird the visceral power of someone making like a high-pitched animal shriek <laughs> but i know you're a big fan of the aztec death whistle That's true. and also similarly the the confederacy would do this thing called the yeah. rebel yell where they would all scream and then charge and there was tons of reports of people deserting for both these things so i'm like wow patter is gonna throw on there too the like shriek right before they pull the rope and the guy drops holy cow so i mean i can't tell if it's just that i'm like Sometimes when you see history, you feel like, okay, I, I see it and I know it. Like, there it is. Like, you can't make that up, right? I don't know if it's that or it's that I'm just so in love with this scene because it's just so extreme. Like, I feel like I want to go out and make a movie about it right now. But that just shook everything I was hanging on to. I was like, maybe I never saw a picture of an elephant being hung by the railroad tracks. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I made that up. Just imagine um, So. It. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll be honest. I felt really confident until you got to that point, and then it just all went sideways. Um, and and I think this is the conclusion that ultimately I have come to, is that there's, there's a lot of very real historic-feeling details in the story of the hangings and, and our capuchin monkey. A lot of things where it feels like, I kind of need to explain like what this mechanism of execution is in order for this story to make sense to you. And I think that that definitely gives it a lot of evidence that that's the true story. It could of course also be that you heard this story about murderous Mary and then you're like, okay, this one's a little on the short side. Let me use my journalist skills to paint some color commentary into this idea about a monkey story, which I think you're fully capable of doing, but you know what, if that's what you've done, I'm just going to give you the, the the gold medal, Luis. Go ahead and take the point. I think that Patter, the capuchin monkey executioner, is real. I'm praying that this scene really happened. And you know what? Let me go all in. Fingers crossed that there was no poor murders Mary who had to be executed on try number uh, two yeah. for crying out loud <laughs> down by the railroad tracks. Okay, I'm I'm all in on uh, I think that Patter is the true story. Well, you know, let's skip the pitter-patter, Kurt. And let me tell you that Patter, oh, good point, good point. the Capuchin Monkey, is made up. No! Oh, this is so crushed. <laughs> it's a double whammy because it's like, <laughs> no monkey execution and, and they hung an and elephant. And Murderous Mary was hanged for nothing. <laughs> no! Oh, okay. Well, you know, give me something, Luis. Was I at least close on your thought process here of what happened with the story creation? Or did I get anything well, right? Well, Kurt, I will say that um, you were very very on the nose with the story creation. I, I saw the story of Murderous Mary and I thought okay, about good. the phrase animal cruelty and immediately thought, what if it was the other way around, right? What if there was cruelty performed by the animal? And immediately to my brain came the thought of Capuchin Monkey pulling an executioner's lever. But, you know, it couldn't be as simple as that because that seems a little too morbid. So I had to, you know, invent this henry pierpoint fella now the entire the entire story the john scarborough newspaper article that i quoted i wrote that 
<laughs> earlier, wow. you know, today. And I wrote that. You've really stepped up your game. You, you're right. I, I did try to speak as a journalist of the time and invented an entire story. Like always, I made a story that made me smile and made me laugh. And that's how. Oh, man. How that came to be, you know. Now, interestingly enough, Henry Pierpoint was a real person. He was also indeed an executioner, and he did have a son named Albert Pierpoint, who was one of the most prolific mm-hmm. and notorious executioners of all time in Britain. But that's as far as the truth goes. Wow. Well, you know, I, I have two things to say here. First of all, uh, and this is a little bit funny, but I guess, you know, the difference between you found a very long and detailed story and then made up a kind of brief story to go with it versus you found a brief story and made up a very long and detailed story to go with it. I guess I was kind of betting on you having done the lesser effort thing, <laughs> um, which, you know, I, I will still defend that decision, but it did it did burn me this time. But yeah, I got to say, even even, you know, it's almost like the Turing test, because even looking right at it, knowing like, OK, this this passage that you're quoting me could be made up by you i still thought like man this is such a vivid scene so yeah that that one's gonna stick with me the monkey execution that one you really nailed it that that was just because i mean i think that the idea you had is great and you tied it in to history in ways that felt really real again where there were a lot of a lot of tangential and kind of peripheral details that were almost like monotonous in a way where it felt very rooted in history but also just the moment of someone describing this thing happening. Uh, That was some really amazing storytelling. I I really, really enjoyed that. Um, And I'm, you know, I think I'm trying to focus on that because I don't want to think about how I have to now accept that murders Mary. It's even worse that they messed it up the first time. Oh man, this is like, it's, it's so American in the most unfortunate way. Yeah, Yeah. You know, every single detail there is true. And, and funny enough, you know, we talked in a previous episode about how a lot of these stories seem to be just legends and local myths that happened. But this is actually a verified story. You know, you can go in and wow. check the newspaper files for when they killed an elephant by hanging. Well, and of course, I've got the picture, this photograph, They, they, they right? do have a photograph of the event. And now, I, of the photograph is disputed of being real. Uh, there are some researchers that say that Claim mm. that it is real. Some say that it's a recreation, but regardless of whether like no, 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 this was a different elephant. Yeah, right, that took place yeah, in East another Tennessee. Tuesday, this was yeah, a couple years earlier. Now, interestingly, yeah. <laughs> they regardless of whether or not it's a real picture, it's if it's a fake one, it's a recreation of a real event, right? So that's exactly what it would have looked like, right? Either way, it's it's something that's so so odd and and visceral to see that it. It really makes an imprint on you. So we'll we'll post it on our social media if you guys want to see this as well. Because it is something that... It's just a photo that when you look at it, if you can tell you're seeing an odd piece of history. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, looking look at it at your own discretion. Because, to yeah, be honest, it's, it's a picture that's a little... I don't know if disturbing is the word, but it's off-putting for sure. It's just sad. Yeah, There's no reason why an elephant should ever be being executed by being hanged. You know? Kurt, I've sent you a picture of the image that exists of this elephant and please if you could give us your thoughts okay well intriguingly first of all this was not the picture i was picturing so whatever i thought i remembered this was not it um it's it's a lot older of a photo than i thought it would be it's it's one of those pictures where it's it's you can see that it's so dated by the poor camera technology that it's like really at the beginning of uh you know, when we had media that could capture things exactly as they were. So that's that's really interesting. You know, I, I always like looking at those pictures because, like I say about this kind of weird time in American history, that's one of the only direct links we have to see it exactly or at least close to exactly as it was in that time. And, you know, trying to picture this as, as a, a real scene. You know, I'm from, from rural Missouri, which is a lot similar to rural East Tennessee, I, I would imagine, but also in my experiences. So I'm I'm trying to picture, you know, seeing this happening or, or hearing this is happening in a nearby town. It, it's just so bizarre to think that it's it's not that far away from me in time and it's not that far away from me geographically, but this is just like a situation out of another world. It really is. And, you know, it really goes to show you just how big circuses were at this point and to what lengths people would go to, you know, be entertained, whether it was to go see elephants or other animals at a circus or how a whole city, a whole town flocked to go see an elephant being executed you know right 
Right. It's 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 interesting, you know, it's peculiar. But sadly, that means that murderous Mary was indeed murderous. She did kill someone and then face punishment for her crimes. She was stand your ground, Mary. <laughs> she was self defense, <laughs> Mary. <laughs> we're changing the narrative. We're we're taking back the the Mary yeah, narrative. Yeah, <laughs> you know, is there a castle doctrine in East Tennessee? <laughs> So, so you know what, Luis? Because I, I don't know how long it'll be till we get another Mary for our Mary list. Let's let's real quick right now to to close out this episode. Let's um let's let's list off who who's our villains and heroes of the Mary list. So so first of all, Typhoid Mary, hero or villain in the, your book? The villain for sure. Villain. Yeah. Okay, villain. All right. So Typhoid Mary, villain. Uh, next is is then the Mary Celeste, the the boat, <laughs> hero or villain? <laughs> you know, hero. Hero, hero. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm with it. Hero. Okay, all right. We one, one for each side. Mary Toft is trying to scam the crown out of some, some money by uh, fake birthing rabbits hero. and cats. Hero, hero for villain. sure. Yeah. Hero. I, you know mm-hmm. what? I'm glad you said that because I'm with it too. Anti-hero, dare I say. All right. And then that finally brings us to murderous Mary. And there are wrong answers, Luis. So I think we're going it. to be, we're going to have deferring opinions, Kurt, because I'm sorry. She committed a crime. Oh, Wow. <laughs> Wow, you're a very big I, rule of law guy over here. Big, big law and order. You lad. know, Kurt, I would have been there lifting the crane. <laughs> Just me and my capuchin monkey. Luis is, Luis is huge pro mandatory minimum sentencing for elephants. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We got to get these these super criminal elephants off the street. As soon as you hear the screech of a monkey, Kurt, at 6 a.m., you know another elephant has fallen to the hands of justice. The shriek of the capuchin will let you know that Luis Mejia has made these streets a little safer. And you can all sleep a little soundly. <laughs> well, I guess I guess I want to disagree with you, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to defer to you because you are the, the victor of this episode, so... That gives us two hero Marys, two villain Marys. I guess we're, the next Mary may be the tiebreaker. But speaking of not tiebreakers, our current scoreboard is two points for you, zero points for me. So that's it's it's looking rough. It's uh, man, I'm really worried that there's like some kind of pendulum effect of like you win big the first season, I win big the second season, and then you're gonna win big now. So, but but let, I don't wanna I don't wanna to speak it into existence. We're all good vibes over here. I'm I'm ready with some smoke and mirrors for you next time. But yeah, that was that was a wild episode, Louis. Those were some great stories. Thank you, Kurt. And you know what? We'll keep it up. Again, it's a third season. We gotta keep it up with the smoke and the mirrors. And I'm going to do all my best, Mm. all my power to keep fooling you. And speaking of fooling, were you, the audience, able to determine what the story was? Whether you listening to the tale of Murderous Mary and did not believe or trust a single word I said, I understand you. But let us know if you were able to get this story correctly. We are on social media. You can find us on Instagram at UnbelievablePod. You can also find us on Twitter or X at UnbelievablePC. And really, you can find us anywhere you'd like to listen to this show share it around give it a quick rating or don't we are not the bosses of you so thank you once again yeah no biggie whatever. Yeah, do whatever you want and we'll be seeing you next time everyone and remember don't get between mary and a watermelon she's liable to get murderous okay or if you depending on who you ask maybe self-defensive who knows see ya bye